All set. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm joined here today by Mayor Brandon Johnson, Deputy Mayor Gary and Gatewood, and Third Ward Alderman Pat Dow. We're also joined here by Chief of Detectives Antoinette Ercity. We're here to discuss our plan to address the robberies and motor vehicle thefts occurring in our city. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge the victims of these crimes and be clear that we are working to investigate and seek justice on your behalf. These robberies have created trauma for the victims and fear in our communities. That's why we have a department-wide plan to address these crimes. We want everyone in this city to not only feel safe, but to actually be safe. The plan focuses on four pillars, technology, focused missions, public engagement, and accountability. As our detectives and officers work to address these crimes, we're also working with public and private partners to raise awareness and encourage prevention. We want to be proactive and not just reactive when these crimes occur. This includes vehicle safety days we are hosting in conjunction with law enforcement and business partners. We've been hosting these vehicle safety days each weekend since February and will continue to host throughout May. We're also partnering with Hyundai and Kia to host vehicle safety days the first week in May at Guaranteed Rate Field, where eligible vehicle owners can obtain software updates that can help prevent vehicle thefts. Members of our command staff are also meeting with business groups, utility companies, and those who work in neighborhoods across the city. During these meetings, we have open discussions about their public safety concerns, and we are able to provide them with robbery safety tips, as well as how they can help us solve crimes. We're doing everything in our power to hold the offenders of these crimes accountable. Our officers are risking their own safety to apprehend these violent criminals, knowing the violence they are capable of. Our detectives and investigating, our detectives are investigating these crimes because it's important to the victims to see justice for the crimes that are being committed. But we need the full support of the criminal justice system. We will continue working with our prosecutorial partners to hold these offenders responsible and accountable. And what you see up here is part of the partnership I'm talking about. We're up here together because this isn't just about law enforcement. Everyone in government and in the community has a role to play. This goes to the mayor's idea of the full force of government to have everyone be a part of bringing this city safe streets. Our message is clear. If you commit these crimes, there will be consequences. With that, I'd like to invite Chief Our City up to give you the overview of the plan. Thank you, Superintendent. Like Superintendent Snelling, I also want to start by acknowledging the victims of these crimes. Those who have experienced a robbery have been through an extremely distressing event. Our plan is truly focused on prevention to make sure others do not have to endure such trauma. But to be clear, when these crimes do occur, we will identify and hold accountable the perpetrators who have caused harm. We are utilizing technology like license plate readers and pod cameras to locate and apprehend those responsible for robberies and motor vehicle thefts. Often, our strategic decision support centers are able to observe offenders in real time and relay that information to officers on the ground to take immediate enforcement action. Within every district, officers are available to identify, collect, and preserve video evidence that is crucial 
to our investigations. Members of the Bureau of Detectives, the Bureau of Patrol, the Bureau of Counterterrorism meet regularly to review and discuss incidents and videos. Our patrol and detective leadership weekly direct meetings that are data-driven and focus on identifying where these crimes are happening and who is repeatedly committing them. We're able to use this information to disseminate community alerts to the public, often with video, which can generate information and tips that assist in the investigation. These community alerts are put out in the hopes that those with information come forward, either by calling detectives or submitting an anonymous tip at cpdtip.com. With most of these crimes, someone out there knows something. This information can be vital in solving a case. Discussions in these meetings also help us strategically deploy resources so that we can stop robbery offenders through focused missions. One example of this is the robbery missions that the Bureau of Patrol has been conducting in Area 5 on the city's northwest side in partnership with the Area 5 detectives. Late last month during a robbery mission, five offenders were placed into custody because of this strategic deployment of resources. When offenders robbed a victim at gunpoint, the officers deployed in this robbery mission immediately homed in on these offenders and placed them into custody. Each was charged with multiple felonies, including armed robbery, possession of a stolen motor vehicle, and unlawful use of a weapon. Not only were they taken into custody, but the officers recovered four weapons and a vehicle programmer, a device that can be used to steal vehicles. The use of stolen vehicles in the commission of robberies is why vehicle safety days and events with anti-theft software upgrades are so important. During these days, we provide prevention resources, such as catalytic converter etchings and steering wheel clubs. This directly addresses the rise in catalytic converter thefts and motor vehicle thefts. I also want to highlight the work of our vehicular hijacking task force, which focuses on investigating vehicular hijackings and stolen vehicles. In addition to their daily operations, they conduct multiple joint operations each month that are focused on recovering stolen and hijacked vehicles, as well as apprehending those who are responsible. Just late last night, the task force concluded one of these operations alongside our local, state, and federal law enforcement partners. So far this year, the task force has conducted 10 operations, resulting in more than 80 arrests and the recovery of more than 140 stolen or hijacked vehicles. These operations are supported by the CPD helicopter unit, which provides eyes in the sky and helps our officers on the ground track stolen vehicles. The task force also utilizes technology such as license plate readers to locate stolen vehicles. I cannot stress enough the great work our detectives and officers are doing across the department and putting into these investigations and incidents collaboratively with one another and our public safety partners. Ultimately, these efforts are the foundation of strong criminal cases that bring violent offenders to justice provide closure for victims, and prevent future incidents. Thank you. I'd now like to introduce Mayor Brandon Johnson. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Superintendent, for your both of you all's leadership, putting forth this new strategy to combat robberies and foster safety in our neighborhoods. Through this collaborative, community-driven, and technology-driven approach, I'm confident in our ability to investigate crimes and bring justice to our communities. And everyone in every neighborhood deserves to feel safe walking down the street, commuting to work, and enjoying life in our wonderful city. The key to making that vision a reality is collaboration. And that is why I'm also grateful for our Deputy Mayor, Community Safety, Deputy Mayor Gatewood, and to the Alder of the Third Ward, Alderwoman Pat Dow. As the Chicago Police Department works to meticulously and strategically prevent and solve crimes, we as Chicagoans can do our part to build thriving and safe neighborhoods as well. And through my administration's community safety strategy, the People's Plan for Community Safety, the full force of government is activated and focused on our collective mission 
We are determined to nurture our partnerships as well as create new partnerships with community members, neighborhood organizations, faith groups, local business owners, the folks in the philanthropic community and all other stakeholders across Chicago to foster peace as well as safety. City government will also robustly invest in the people and places throughout Chicago that need those investments. We are working to ensure that disinvested neighborhoods and their residents have everything they need to thrive. And that includes affordable housing, to make sure that we have good parks and grocery stores, health clinics, as well as strong neighborhood schools. We are also working to invest in people. And that includes in their education, their access to health care, jobs, entrepreneurial opportunities, and so much more. It is no surprise to anyone that the most disinvested areas of our city also experienced the highest crimes as well as violence. With sustained investments that address the root causes of crime and with the help of all residents, we will build a safer Chicago. I want to urge and remind our residents that city government and police alone cannot build a safer city. Everyone must join in our effort. Everyone must join in this collective effort whether that means engaging with community police or looking out for our neighbors, we all have the power to make an impact. And as mayor of the city of Chicago, I'm calling on all of the residents to do just that. Those who have been victims and those who have been in communities that have been disinvested in, it is going to take all of us to build truly a better, stronger, safer Chicago. And I want to close again by thanking Superintendent Snelling and the entire Chicago Police Department and this command staff and their leadership in implementing this new strategy. Thank you all. And with that, I will turn it back over to Superintendent Snelling. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, with that, we'll take any questions. The, um, if you didn't hear the question, the question was, how do we feel about arresting an 11-year-old child um, who has engaged in armed robbery um, or stolen vehicle or, or carjacking? It's disturbing. It's disturbing to not understand, uh, to not understand that we can't figure out where the parents are for this 11-year-old. Where's the responsibility uh, for that 11-year-old? We don't necessarily know the conditions for that 11-year-old, but that's not something that we ever want to find ourselves doing as a police agency locking up children. However, when these young children are engaging in violent acts, um, today's juvenile um, robbery offender or shooter is tomorrow's adult murderer. So we, we have to do something um, to catch our children very young so that they don't engage in these types of acts. And when we do catch them, we have to have those services um, to deal with an 11 or a 12 year old that we know that we're not going to incarcerate so that they don't go back out and become repeat offenders. This is why it's important to have every, every single person engaged so that we don't go back down that road again. Good afternoon, Superintendent Iris Berrios with Telemundo. Can you be more specific about this technology? Is going to be new? Are you adding more cameras? Where you're going to be? And how is going to make uh, the people feel more safe? So what, what we we don't want to give up everything, but here's one of the things that I can tell you. You know, our SDSC rooms, our ATC rooms, our, our area technology uh, rooms. Uh, it's very important to understand that we've done great work with that and we've solved murders and, and uh, vehicular hijackings, shootings. Um, it's connected with uh, the transit system, CTA. And we know that robberies happen in and around those locations. So number one, when we talk about technology, we have the technology to gather information. The next thing that we have to have is a focused mission. 
right? It has to be uh, targeted. What are we looking at? So we're starting with stolen vehicles because we know those stolen vehicles are being used in secondary crimes, like robberies. In most cases where we have robberies that occur or robbery sprees, these are individuals who are jumping out of stolen vehicles. If we can get a handle on those stolen vehicles, which we're, we're working, we, we have close to 3,000 less stolen vehicles this year than we had last year, probably a little less than that, but we've still got a long way to go with that. With that, now we have to look at the violent act of three to four masked young people jumping out of a vehicle and pointing guns at people and taking their belongings. If we can get a handle on the stolen vehicles, we can get a handle on how these crimes are being committed. Now, we're also looking at areas, locations, and times when these robberies are occurring. And we want to make sure that we have the right personnel out there to deal with these situations. Obviously, we would love, we, we love to use air support in these situations because most times, even if our officers find these individuals and they're in cars, they flee. That air support will help us follow those individuals without engaging in a full-blown vehicle pursuit. Keeps everyone safe. We can find the location that they, uh, that they end up going into. And if we have to, depending on the circumstances, we may be able to go in or we, we can write up a search warrant because we know where they are. We've got them uh, contained and then we can go in and get them at that point. Accountability is a major factor. We have to hold ourselves accountable for getting this job done and making sure that it's done properly, having our supervisors out there driving, driving this initiative. And lastly, but not lastly, community engagement. As we engage with communities, as we talk to people, not just our alders, not just our business owners, but our community members, giving them information on how they can avoid being victimized, and then how they can report these things, notifying all of your neighbors, flyering, and having our officers go out and talking to community members. So this is different from what we've been doing. We don't want an ad hoc approach to this. We want it to be focused and we have expected outcomes. And in order to do that, we have to have a focused drive. Superintendent Craig Wall with ABC7. Um, looking ahead to this weekend, it's gonna be one of the first really nice weekends. Uh, we know what often happens. Uh, large groups of young people in the past have come downtown and caused a lot of problems. What are you planning for this weekend to try to intervene there or deter there? And, and then what's your message to kids who might be thinking about doing more than coming downtown and having a good time? That, that's a great uh, uh, question, Craig. First of all, we're going to do what we've been doing. Um, we've had a lot of teen gatherings that we found online um, and we get out in front of it. What we do is we get resources down there before they get there so we can deter a lot from happening. Um, there are times where we look and there are supposed to be thousands of teens that are to converge upon downtown based on the information that we've gathered and the intel that we have. We've been able to get out in front of that and keep that number minimal. Uh, if you look probably since last April, when we had the last very large team gathering down there, we've, we've been on top of it. Now, what we don't want to do is go overboard and we're stopping teens who are down there to uh, educate themselves or have fun and they're doing the right thing. We, don't, we want them to have fun. But for those who decide they want to go into downtown, wreak havoc, attack people, fight, take guns into these locations, destroy property, we're going to arrest you. We're not going to tolerate it. We're going to make sure that if you're down there to enjoy yourself, please go down there to enjoy yourselves, but do not, do not destroy property, do not engage in acts of violence, and you will not have to worry about the Chicago Police Department. But if you do, we will take action. So for this weekend, we have plans in place. We have intel on certain incidents that we believe could happen. And we will, we will have resources in place prior to anyone getting there. 
Hi, Superintendent Tessa Weinberg, WBZ News. You know, CPD says that traffic stops are made because of probable or reasonable suspicion that a crime has or will be committed. You know, was the stop of Derek Reed made solely because of purported seatbelt violation, or was the tactical unit interested in Reed for other reasons? And if it was indeed just a traffic stop, why was it being made by a five-person tactical unit? So here's what I'll tell you. Those officers up to this point have not been interviewed. So without those officers being interviewed and having something concrete that is written where these officers gave a statement as to why that traffic stop occurred, we can't speculate on that. And there's speculation out there in the media right now as to why that happened. Now, I'm not saying that that couldn't be true, but I can't comment on that and I will not comment on that because those officers have not been interviewed. And without an interview of the officers, all of the evidence has, has, is not complete. So those who are putting that information out into the media are doing so irresponsibly. So as the, the investigation unfolds, you'll, you'll be able to get more information as to why that occurred. So what I will not do is speculate and I'm not going to be irresponsible in giving you a statement on something that we don't have all of the evidence on. So when that happens, you'll get that information. What I can tell you is that the Chicago Police Department, we are cooperating 100 percent with the investigation. I believe in the integrity of the investigation, which is why I'll never say anything that's going to sway that investigation or frame people's minds around how that investigation should go. So I'm going to allow that to occur the way that it's supposed to. And when we have more information, we'll be able to provide more. If you, can't, if you can't speak to the specific facts of, you know, Reed shooting, can you just kind of share more details? You've said that CPD so far this year has conducted 46,000 fewer traffic stops compared to the same period a year ago. Can you share more details about, you know, what traffic stops that entails and what officers are doing differently then that's leading to less traffic stops? Well, I, I can't get into what, how, close to 50,000 traffic stops because today is closer to 49,000 right now at this point. All I can tell you is this, is we have a different focus. My focus is different. My focus is not just about traffic stops. I'm not looking at an old school way of policing and keeping crime down. We have a focus, a focus mission. And our mission is to go after those people who are committing violent, violent crimes. So what I can tell you is being down that uh, close to 49,000 traffic stops, we're up 14% in gun arrests, gun recoveries. We're also up in felony arrests. So it tells me that we're trending in the right direction. It takes time for change to take full effect, but we do see change happening. Hi, Superintendent. This is Maria Berreyesa from Univision. Uh, so you mentioned uh, you guys are working in conjunction uh, with the law enforcement and also with local businesses. Uh, the, my question is, is specifically with the community, Hispanic community, sometimes they're afraid to report these uh, uh, robberies. And my question to you is, what's the message for them? And how is this going to work out between local businesses and the police department? That, that's a good question. And we, we do know, especially with some of the vendors who have been robbed in, in um, I believe it's Little Village, the, the message is this. The Chicago Police Department, the only thing that we're concerned about is your safety. You, you should never have a fear of reporting a crime that has been committed against you. So we're not going to go in with any bias. We know that you've been victimized and we're going to do everything that we can to apprehend the, the people who have victimized you. Otherwise, it's going to continue. Not only that, they're going to victimize other people. So the help, even from that community, is going to be really helpful in us apprehending individuals who are committing these crimes and it's going to help make them safer. Hi, Superintendent. Heather How Sharon, WTTW News. How are you, Heather? Um, several weeks ago, you said that COPA had acted with bias and based on individual prejudice in involving specific investigations of officers. Given those comments, 
are you confident that COPA is handling the investigation into the officers who shot at, Derek, or at Dexter Reed appropriately? And what would you say to officers who heard those remarks you made and said, COPA will not treat us fairly in this investigation? Well, first of all, when I was speaking, that wasn't about this investigation. Obviously, this hadn't happened at the time. What I would hope is that the integrity of this investigation isn't jeopardized, which is why you won't hear me comment about what happened. Because I believe in one thing, accountability, transparency. If we have someone within our department who shouldn't be here, then we should do everything that we need to do to remove that individual. Why? Because we have way too many officers doing too many great things out there to have it jeopardized by someone who shouldn't be here. But at the same time, we should let a proper investigation play out and it should be fair across the board. Nothing and no one should be judged in the court of public opinion. So my concern is that the integrity of the investigation isn't jeopardized and all of the evidence is collected and looked at properly, that it's assessed properly. And whatever the outcome is, we will deal with that when it happens. But I just believe that all of the investigation, of the, the investigation should be completed by collecting all of the evidence and then making a proper assessment. Next question, Charlie. Will you um, agree with COPA's recommendations to strip the officers involved in the Dexter Reed sh shooting of their police powers after they complete their 30-day administrative leave? It, it's an amazing thing um, that that information about stripping officers is out there. When we're talking about a proper investigation and we have not heard from the officers, I will not make a decision to strip officers until that investigation unfolds. Right now, they're, they're at 30 days. This is, this is our process. However, it's a minimum of 30 days. I can decide how long those officers stay off the street. So that's going to be up to me. But what I'm going to do, as I said before, is let the investigative bodies work in the manner in which they work. I will not, and I refuse to interfere with that or say anything that's going to interfere with that. And when the recommendations come, uh, come down, I will assess whatever that recommendation is, and then I will make the decision as that happens. I can't predict what that investigation is going to unfold. Good afternoon, Superintendent. Charlie Wojciechowski from Channel 5. We, we all know the mayor's uh, policing strategy involves investing in young people, investing in communities, but we realize that's going to take time to pay off. Is this strategy announced today part of an acknowledgement that you're going to have to do something in the meantime until that starts to pay off? That, that's a, a perfect assessment. Well, Joe, I mean, basically what it boils down to is we have to do both. And the reason that we have to do both, the long-term strategy is going to help us down the road. I mean, let's be honest. This is a, a, a double-digit year fix, right? We didn't get here overnight. And when we start talking about social problems and socioeconomic problems that affect communities, we have to rebuild those communities and we have to start with the very, very young children because they're going to be the next wave. But in the meantime, what do we do to keep people safe in this city so that they feel comfortable walking to their cars without the fear of being robbed or carjacked? We're going to make sure that we're holding criminals who are engaging in violent acts accountable. I've said that since I started, and I mean every, every word of it. We are going after violent offenders because we have to think about the trauma that they are inflicting upon our citizens. So quite often, and over the years, we've been focused on so many other things, even the crime, that we have forgotten about the victims of those crimes. So we will be focusing on the victims of these crimes. If I may, just a quick follow-up with Alderman Dow. What do you think of what, are your, what you're hearing today uh, and how it applies to your ward? And if you could please step to the podium and answer. 
Well, when the superintendent talks about this being, and the mayor talks about this being a collaborative effort, it truly is. Um, so, you know, I work with my uh, business community, my constituents, and other stakeholders in the community to make sure I get information, to make sure that uh, young people are being invested in. Um, for example, I'm working with the church, True Rock Ministries, that has adopted Mollison Elementary School and about 22 boys that are in that school. Uh, you know, to help mentor them. Um, we uh, encourage our residents to go to some of these vehicle training sessions or vehicle care sessions. Um, we encourage phone trees. Um, even in my own development, my neighbors and I, and there's 18 of us, we have a texting uh, group text. And so this is something that uh, I encourage um, and continue to work with. I think it's very important that we do have collaboration because it is a hands every, all hands on deck issue. Good afternoon, Superintendent Sarah Schulte with Channel 7. Um, Good, this is actually a, a question for both you and the mayor. Um, as you know, the consent decree was put in place to prevent something like the Dexter Reed incident from even happening to begin with. So what are you doing to increase compliance? I mean, as you know, the, the uh, court monitor said, but last November only, but it's the, the rate is 6%. Um, so I'm just interested what both of you are gonna do to make sure it's, you know, the compliance rate increases so we don't get another Dexter Reed incident. So let me, let me just go a little further on the consent decree and compliance numbers. There are three levels of compliance when it comes to the consent decree. The first one, preliminary, is policy development. Then we get into the second level. Now, policy development right now, we're about 88%. Now, that process includes a lot of bodies. We have the IMT, the OAG is a part of that. And we want to make sure that we have the right things in the policy, though that, so that has to be approved. That can take several months. From that point, we have to go into training. So that's secondary compliance. Right now, we're at close to 50% in secondary compliance. We don't reach operational compliance, which is full compliance, until we have all of those things uh, completed the training and some of those compliance levels require the training to be in place for several years. So when we talk about the compliance numbers, those can become talking points that CPD isn't doing much. What I will tell you is this, the consent decree is just a piece of paper if we're not actually doing something. So I can talk about the compliance numbers. We could write up anything and say that we're in compliance. The question is, are we being effective with changing the way that we expect our officers to work? So what we want to look at and what I'm looking at is quality and quality training. How do we get our officers in as quickly as possible and train? So where we see deficiencies with our officers right now, we already have policies and great training programs in place that we need to get our officers back through. I'm looking to do that now because, you know, we train our officers when they come out of the academy as brand new recruits. When they hit the street, it's still fresh in their minds. After two to three years, if we don't give them that refresher training and rebuild them to get them to understand that, hey, this is the way that we're going to continue to do uh, things, it breaks down over time. So our officers have to be reminded as well as trained. And this is where our supervisors come into place to make sure that our officers are following everything it is we need them to follow. And we're going to hold our, our supervisors accountable to do that. But why aren't the officers being, the, the veteran officers, why aren't they being trained on a regular basis on de-escalation? The officers are being trained on a regular basis. Here's the problem. When we have... 10, 11,000 officers, and part of the consent decree are other training programs. So now we have to get those officers through training as well as, well as get them new training. So once we do that, we also have to balance that with keeping some officers on the street. Because if we are not balancing that, 
All of our officers are in training and none of them are out in the field actually doing the work. So we will get there. This is not, we can't wave a magic wand and get every officer trained. But the best way to train an officer in de-escalation is through stress inoculation training. They actually have to physically go through training where they get to feel the stress of a situation that they're going to be dealing with. Mayor, did you want to, I was just asking too. No, he, he covered it. But I mean, I mean, it's an issue that you brought up in the campaign and yeah. how important it is for you to. Yeah, the superintendent is covering it. Thank you. Okay. Next question. Good afternoon, Superintendent Mohamed Samra with the Sun Times. Um, why didn't you appear at the news conference earlier this week alongside Mayor Johnson, uh, COPA Chief Administrator Andrea Kirsten, and State's Attorney Kim Fox? Because there was not much that I could add. Basically, COPA is an independent body of the Chicago Police Department that is oversight for the Chicago Police Department. That press conference was to explain the process. My being there couldn't add much other than what myself and the mayor had been talking about that we've been talking about since he appointed me, about transparency, about accountability. We have a great communication between the two of us. We meet multiple times a week to talk about crime issues. He expresses his concern about some of the major crimes that are happening around the city, especially the violent crimes. And we have these conversations and we talk about those things. But again, I'm not going to do anything to frame anybody's mind about what happened in that shooting. Listen, as the Chicago Police Department and as the leader of the Chicago Police Department, I have to be very careful about what I say because when you're, when you're the police in this environment right now, and you have a police-involved shooting, anything you say can be taken that you're being biased. So again, I'm not going to say anything that is going to jeopardize the integrity of the investigation. I want it to play out. So the investigative bodies were there. I, I, I thought Kim Fox did an excellent job of breaking down and explaining the process. And there was nothing more that I could add to that. And uh, me and, and the mayor have a great relationship. I've heard the talk about my not being there. Um, there is a problem between myself and the mayor. That is absolutely not true. I love the fact that the mayor gives me autonomy. We talk, we listen, we have these conversations, and I think it's very effective. Did you want to present video that showed the officer's perspective of what happened in that? We've heard that the mayor's office shut down that effort Craig, Craig, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to give you that. That's not true. So what I'm looking to do in the future is have a way of getting information out as quickly as we can, because as the Chicago Police Department, I want to be as transparent as possible. I've said it before, Chicago Police Department has nothing to hide. Now, rather we feel that it's good or bad, we will be putting information out there. Now, what we want to do is make sure that we get that right. So the first time we do it, we don't roll something out that we don't feel is 100% complete or that's not going to be taken as bias. So we have to make sure that we get it right. The other thing is we want to make sure that we don't interfere with the investigation. So COPA was going to release the video. We allowed that to happen. Brandon Eisen with WBBM News Radio, and uh, I'm going to shift gears a little bit uh, with a, a question from my newsroom, um, mostly for the mayor. Uh, and with the the 70 million dollars coming for that you're asking for the migrants additional funding, uh, since we're at CPD headquarters, is there anything concerning public safety involved with that? I, I know that I hear from the migrants directly that. Um, there are times where they are experiencing crimes against them within the shelters. Uh, and then there's also um, from their accounts, uh, and I haven't seen anything necessarily coming down the wire in, in big amounts, um, but they're going to the nearby stores, um, some migrants, uh, and choosing to kind of victimize some of the stores in the nearby areas. Is there anything uh, addressing public safety in that 70 million, or is there anything just uh, that you'd like to say about it? Sure, um, thank you for that question. And you have the perfect voice for the WBBM, by the way. 
So since this mission has begun, as everyone in this room knows, um, we have a governor, the state of Texas, that is determined to create chaos. Um, because of the structure and the direction of my administration, we have avoided that. From clearing out police districts, airports, creating an operation that's centered around people's humanity. And so over the course of these first 11 months, I've gone to the city council multiple times, $51 million, $150 million in my budget for this fiscal year, including $95 million that again, all required city council approval. Um, we anticipate that the governor of Texas will continue his tirade against this country and so a part of my budget structure, we put together um, some reserves in the event of, of, an, inf, uh, of, of an expedited flow of more migrants. You know, as far as how it relates to public safety, uh, our deputy mayor, mm -hmm. uh, Gatewood, along with the superintendent, including our alders. We have been working collectively, collaboratively to address some of the current concerns that you've articulated, you know, but again, you know, in order for, um, you know, this operation or public safety as a whole um, to, to reflect the vision that I've set out, um, it is gonna take all of us. As far as specific dollars um, that would go specifically um, to, to public safety, um, anytime we invest in people, anytime, that builds a better, stronger, safer Chicago. I appreciate the leadership of our superintendent, but as we've said repeatedly, policing alone doesn't get us there. Jails and incarceration hasn't gotten us there. In fact, the investments that we have made already, as the superintendent has spoken to, our public safety strategy is a two-pronged approach, investing in people and places. 35 of the most violent beats in the city of Chicago, where 53% or more of the violence happens in the city of Chicago, there's a 40% decrease in homicides and a 31% decrease in shootings. So we're seeing the effects and the benefits of my investments today. And so it's gonna to continue to take all of us. Those conversations are ongoing, um, but I do appreciate the question and your wonderful voice. Uh, I hope my voice compares. Um, <laughs> it does, it does. Okay. Uh, Superintendent, COPA had mentioned the tactical team in question in Dexter Reed's shooting had been on the radar for previous behavior. Why is that, and is there any concern or action going forward to keep track of these tactical teams and the work that they're doing? So we have a dashboard, and I'm making sure, and as a matter of fact, we I had a meeting with all of our command staff that we will be checking that dashboard regularly. It's, it's through um, our TREAD uh, system. So basically what it is, it will give us alerts if we see officers who have multiple complaints. And then at this point, we'll take action based on what we see. It could be training. It could be taking that officer from the street for a while and then assessing the officer. Um, does the officer need uh, EAP, uh, some, some type of help from the things that these officers are seeing? When we think about PTSD that officers deal with on a daily basis, what's troubling this officer? So we do a full, we'll be able to do a full assessment of this officer. And if we think that this is somebody who shouldn't be in this position or shouldn't be wearing the uniform, we're going to take action on that too. Look, we, you know, we've got over 11,000 people who work for the Chicago Police Department. You know, not every single person is going to be here faithfully, just like in any other profession. Any other profession, I don't care what it is. I'm sure some of you right now have colleagues that you feel shouldn't be doing the job that they're doing right now and are working unethically. But, but we, as a police department, have to make sure that we have those people, that, that we have them on the radar, and that we take action. But that doesn't mean that every single officer, because you see some complaints against them, that they're bad officers. We just have to make sure that we find out why these officers 
have complaints against him. And if we see patterns of behavior, we will. We absolutely need to address that, and we will address it. Um, but what I can tell you is this. Communication would be, uh, would be appreciated. Um, I don't believe that, it, that if we see something of that nature, that we shouldn't reach out to the heads of departments and talk to them about the problems that you're seeing. So I believe that we're, we're all in professional roles, and we should be professional with each other. Is that new? That's a new thing you guys are doing? It's, it's something that we just recently created, but it's been there for a little while, but we're making sure that there's accountability wrapped around it. Kyle Mazza, UNF News. Thanks for doing this news conference. So in the wake of the Dexter Reed shooting, how do you assure the general public at large that they won't be the next targets of uh, police behavior if, if that does turn out to be the case? H how can they feel safe? And Mayor, regarding ShotSpotter, it, it's been a technology that's been detecting gunshots and, 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 and allowing police to go to the crime scenes quick and, and maybe save a life. You did promise that you would be phasing that out, but in, in cities such as New York City and here in Chicago, the shot spotter technology does do positive things. So why do you think it's an, a negative thing in your view for the city? And superintendent, has shot spotter been a collective uh, tool for the city? Well, let me, let me start with your first question. Um, your first question is how do we assure uh, the public that our officers are going to police um, effectively and fairly. Right now, I'm doing a full assessment of everything. So everything that we see, we, we read, or complaints that we get in, we're taking seriously. One of the things that I'm coming up with right now is a dashboard. And that dashboard is going to be for transparency. You'll be able to go into that dashboard and see everything that's going on within the Chicago Police Department. We will have that posted. I don't have a timeline on that right now, but at least in a couple of weeks, we're looking at uh, getting that thing posted. Here's what I'll tell you, and I'll say this about ShotSpotter. Look, when it comes to ShotSpotter, I've seen our officers get to locations quickly, and I've seen them save lives. And this is one of the things that we don't highlight enough, the life-saving efforts on the part of our police officers. We're quick to put it out there when, we, when an officer looks bad or an officer is engaged in something he, he or she should not have engaged in. But when we look at the effectiveness of what our officers have done to save lives, I'm going to be doing a lot more to get that information out to people. But look, this is something right now that's in city council. I don't make those decisions. So whatever happens, the Chicago Police Department is going to work around it, and we're going to make sure that we keep people safe. So. Yeah, thank you, uh, UNF. All three of your questions in one. It was impressive. Um, the data points around ShotSpotter were very clear. And what I've said repeatedly is that it's going to take more than just technology. Um, investing in communities is what my vision is for the people of Chicago. The difference between Chicago and particularly the neighborhoods that I'm speaking of where the violence is most pervasive, the difference between those neighborhoods and other places around the country, around the world, and around the, the city, quite frankly, that do not have um, the gross inequity that exists in those neighborhoods is that there's been investment. So it's not a coincidence that where poverty school closures, lack of mental health care services, the lack of jobs, the lack of access to reliable um, transportation, it's affordable, child care. If you're not offering those in, in communities, then, then you're providing a very petite approach towards what I have is a quite robust vision for the people of Chicago. Better, so stronger, safer Chicago means investing in people. Um, the decision has been made, and I'm looking forward to our continuous work with the superintendent and community um, organizations and business leaders, the philanthropic community, our neighbors as well, um, to be a part of this longstanding vision that, quite frankly, that people have desired in this city for a very long time. Um, administrations of the past have not been as focused as I have been on getting at the root causes of violence. Without sounding like I'm lecturing anyone, 
a generation ago, President Johnson said we have to get at the root causes of crime, and he was mocked. The governor of Alabama accused President Johnson of saying that crime exists in this country because a black child did not have enough watermelon to eat. This particular generation is going to reject the type of racist ideology that would prevent government from investing in people. Safe communities require investment, and that is what I am doing. Quinn Myers from, from Block Club. Hey, hey Superintendent. How are you? Um, question about pursuing and catching, apprehending robbery suspects. Last fall, we saw a lot of reports and heard at CAPS meetings of um, officers who defer to the state police, um, in part because they say they have a less stringent vehicle pursuit policy. Is there a de facto policy here to rely on state police to apprehend uh, suspects in chases that don't pass the so-called balancing tests that your officers have to follow? No, uh, not, not involving the state police. If the state police are near and uh, they can engage, uh, it's helpful. One of the things is, is uh, during vehicle pursuits, if someone hits the expressway, let's say the Dan Ryan expressway, um, that's the jurisdiction of the state police. So if the state police know that this is going on, they can take it up. The other issue is, um, as you know, we've procured uh, three new helicopters. Uh, they're supposed to be coming in shortly. We should have the 429 prior to the DNC, um, and that, that's the plan to have it there. But that air support helps us a lot with vehicle pursuits. We do have to be very careful as to how we pursue people, because one of the things that uh, people don't understand is in our, uh, uh, our desire to capture this violent criminal, someone who has just created, who just committed a violent act, when they are fleeing, they don't care who they hurt, who they injure. And as the police, we have to weigh that balancing test to make sure that we're not pursuing someone that is going to hurt someone. Now, that being said, there are times where we stop and they continue uh, to flee. At this point, if we have that air support, the air support can follow them to the locations where, the, because they've got to end somewhere. And we've been successful with that air support in getting that done. Now, in the past, when we needed a little help and the, uh, the state police were available and the county, They've helped us out with those things. So we're working in partnership, not only with our county, um, state, but we're also working with our suburban partners, especially when it comes to the robbery missions, because some of these sprees start in the suburbs and they make their way into the city of Chicago. So we do work in partnership with people, but there's nothing written for that. So you're accepting one, one more question, helicopter please. online by the DNC? One, one no, there's one, and then we'll, we'll have two after. So a, for a total of three. By the DNC? No, there'll be one by the DNC. That's our big one. That's our 429. We'll have two 407s by the end of it. Jake Sheridan. Hi, I'm Jake Sheridan from the Tribune. Uh, Superintendent, um, how does a 23-year-old officer end up in a tactical unit in one of the most high-violence police districts in the city? Is that a problem? And for the mayor, how do you respond to the council push uh, to take control over ShotSpotter's future out of your hands? So here, here's what I'll, I'll tell you about that. We have a very, very, very young department. Um, during the year of 2020, um, between 2020 and now, um, with COVID, um, civil unrest, we saw a mass exodus of police officers, police officer retirements. And um, our officers are coming on younger and younger. Now, I will say this, and again, I don't want to jeopardize anything in the integrity of the investigation. This is something that we're looking into. And when something happens, we make the assessments, and this is part of my training background. I look at game time film. Where can we improve? What can we do better? How can we prepare our officers better? What is it that where we failed in leadership when it comes to our officers? Because we're, off, we're asking our officers to do a lot of things. We're asking them to work. We're asking them to put their lives on the line. We're asking them to go out and, and, and uh, apprehend violent offenders. But we're also asking them to go in to, to domestics 
and have compassion for people. We're also asking them that when they come across children to be compassionate and to be aware that there are people out there who are suffering or may be dealing with trauma and to not further traumatize them. There is a huge balance that police officers have to affect when they're out there doing their jobs. And we, as leaders, have to make sure that we give them the tools to do that. So when we look at certain things and within policing and policing strategies where there's a fail, I take that responsibility. Those fails are upon leadership not just the officers. So we have to take responsibility for our officers and we have to make sure that we assess anything that we think may have been a problem and we have to take corrective action for it. Thank you very much. Other, Jake had a question for oh, me. Sorry, it's okay, I was just out of respect of Jake. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, no, all right. No, sorry, Is that okay? okay. Is that okay? Oh, wait, I'm sorry, Jake had a question for me. Oh, go ahead. He already asked it. Oh. I'm just coming to answer it, it's okay. All right, um, thank you for that question. Um, look, since I've been in office, I've been very clear about my vision for the city of Chicago. And that's investing in people because that's what works. And unfortunately, we have not had um, strong fortitude in executive positions in the city of Chicago that have been as focused as I've been on that. And that includes youth employment, paid time off, abolishing sub-minimum wage, the big investments that we're making um, within our business districts to continue to grow our economy, because that's ultimately what's going to keep the city of strong, the city sh better, stronger, and safer. You know, I understand why there are some individuals that have a particular proclivity around certain forms of technology. I do understand it. You know, and the agreement between the mayor's office and the Chicago Police Department, that that power still exists within our space. Um, what I am careful of is that we don't have these ad hoc approaches to how we build a better, stronger, safer Chicago. That is literally the point of this, this mission here, that our work is to keep the entire city of Chicago safe. Look, are, are we grateful that at the end of last year that homicides were down and shootings were down? Are we grateful that we're still seeing that same trend? Yes. Is there more work to be done? Yes. Um, are there forms of technology that the Chicago Police Department is going to use um, to help assist in that effort? Absolutely. Um, I've already made it very clear what my position is around how we invest in people. And when technology works, we give strong consideration to it. When it misses the mark, then we have to reassess it. I did that, we made that decision, and we are still making sure that the full scope and the full force of government is fully engaged in ensuring that a better, stronger, safer Chicago is possible. Thank you, Superintendent. Superintendent, yeah. can I have you clarify you. your remarks when you said that there was, people were putting things out in the media irresponsibly about whether the officers stopped Dexter Reed for seatbelt violation. Were you referring to Here's what I'll tell you. If that information came from COPA, then that's who I'm talking about. Um, the, the key is, and then that information spreads like wildfire. Here, here's, the, here's the issue, uh, Heather, which is really important. And this is important to me. And I'm passionate about this. Because a police officer was shot. I'll repeat, a police officer was shot. A man lost his life. A man lost his life. This isn't something that we should take lightly. This isn't something that should play out in the court of public opinion. Proper investigations should be done before we start litigating online. We had someone who was stoking fear in people and attempting to create chaos with a post that was incomplete. We know what these types of situations can lead to. It's a powder keg. Do we want to see our city burn? 
Do we want people fighting with each other? Do we want more destruction and damage? I think the mayor did an excellent job of going out and getting ahead of this to talk to people, specifically people in, in marginalized communities, to keep, to ha have people keep calm heads. And all in all, I think it was effective. We haven't seen the chaos that we saw in 2020. I just think it's important that we understand that when we have something out there that needs to be investigated, let's investigate it. If we find something that we have proven is wrongdoing, let's take action and let's hold people accountable. But let's not litigate this before we even have all of the facts. So I think it's important that everybody here understand this. And I understand that everybody has a responsibility to report. But please, dig a little deeper. Find out if the statements that are being put out there are factual based on a full investigation. If we have not gathered this information through statements of the officers, because again, you have to have the perspective of those officers who were on scene engaged in this. We don't know what those officers saw or what they thought or how they felt at the time. This is important to get that information prior to making these decisions. And this is why I said again, I will never interfere with the integrity of an investigation. Because if I did that, I have no integrity. We have to let this play out. In the history of policing, some of the issues that we've had is because some people were afraid to make those hard decisions or those decisions appeared hard to them. But when you have the facts, those decisions aren't hard anymore. They become a lot more simple. And you should be willing to make those decisions once you have the evidence. But prior to that, we're setting this on fire and we're throwing fuel on it before we know all of the facts. So all I would ask anybody to do is dig deeper, ask the questions, find out the process. And if we know what those processes are, I think we can report a lot better on what's going on. So as this investigation unfolds, you'll get more information. I hope that that answered uh, your, your question, Heather. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, now I wanna say this last thing because this goes back to our teen gatherings. This weekend, I would just like to send a message to all parents. And the reason that I say this is because there are often times that parents drop their children off downtown because their children have told them that they're going to the movies and they don't know that they're actually down there to engage in a teen gathering. And oftentimes, parents have had to go to the hospital to get their children because they were injured down there or even shot. We've had parents who showed up to the stations to pick up their children, and they thought they were going to one place and did not know that they were engaging in a teen gathering. All I would say is if you drop your kids off somewhere, make sure they're going where they said they're going. And just please, just pay attention because this is the only way that we're going to keep these young people safe and keep the rest of the city safe. With that, thank you everybody. Uh, Craig, I'm gonna put you in timeout next time. So. <laughs> yeah.